It's no secret that many fans feel that Disney has been running Star Wars into the ground. Quantity over quality has been the order of the day since, oh, The Force Awakens. While Tony Gilroy has as of yet held out against what I assume is more pressure than one of those Darth Vader stone crushy moves to sacrifice story for the sake of speed and runtime in order to keep watch hours on Disney Plus up, most other Star Wars producers have apparently caved to such pressures if the Book of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and later seasons of The Mandalorian are any indication. So naturally, I've been a bit weary of finally sitting down and unhealthily binging Ahsoka in a single sitting, as is my preferred method of consumption. But finally, a mixture of boredom, procrastination on my main channel content, and confronted with the fact that I haven't uploaded anything here at Grey Galaxies in over two months, I was finally convinced that it was time to sit down and give Ahsoka an honest chance at winning me over. So rather than yet another YouTuber posting yet another negative video essay about Disney Star Wars because I know it'll get me views, I sat down to write the script with an open mind, with every intention of remaining unbiased. We'll see how well I did at the end. Anyway, let's get this video into hyperspace already. So I'm just going to come out and say it up front, I haven't watched Rebels. I'm familiar with most of the plot lines and characters, and I've skimmed most of the series for footage to use in my ship list videos, but beyond that, I just haven't watched enough to say whether the portrayals of everyone's favorite Rebels are true to their cartoon alter egos. However, I would also just like to mention that the Clone Wars and Rebels also aren't very true to the Star Wars universe either. One example is how all of the aliens in these series speak Galactic Basic, read English, instead of subtitles over alien languages. I know this is because the shows were run for kids, so naturally it would be hard to expect the audience to have the reading speed and comprehension to follow along with subtitles, but as I said, I'm trying to remain unbiased and did want to cut off any of those nasty double standards in the comments before they happen, so I'm not going to focus so much on whether characters as they appear in Ahsoka are true to their representations in the Clone Wars and Rebels. One major exception to this is Eamon Esfandi's portrayal of Ezra Bridger, the casting director freaking nailed it with this one. So forget whether they're as snarky as they were in the cartoons or have some weird eyebrow raise that they do that's missing, as I'll instead be looking at what I personally know to be true of the characters. I'll also try and keep this section of the video relatively spoiler free. For the most part, the acting is top notch. Some of the characters that we run into have already been well practiced in live action Star Wars media, such as Morgan Elspeth and Carson Teva from The Mandalorian, Genevieve O'Reilly's returning portrayal of Mon Mothma from Andor, and of course Ahsoka herself, who appeared in The Mandalorian Season 2 and The Book of Boba Fett. But other than a pretentious New Republic captain who deserves a good humbling, there are really only two portrayals that stuck out to me as outliers, and this comes from Mary Winstead's Harrison Dula, and this is going to rub some fans the wrong way, but Rosario Dawson's own Ahsoka. Hear me out before you let your hate flow through you. Winstead's Hera is the only character that I felt was unsteady or really inconsistent emotionally speaking. In one scene, she's the cool-headed voice of reason, standing her ground against political adversaries and watching recordings of violent crimes being committed. The next, she's visibly shaken by receiving relatively mundane and completely expected news. I will say that anyone playing a role that requires the level of makeup and prosthetics necessary to pull off a good Twi'lek is going to be very uncomfortable, pretty much the entire time they're on set. So I can forgive Mary Winstead a bit here. After all, her predecessors just had to sit in a comfortable chair in a sound studio and make sure their face was the proper distance and orientation to a microphone, and animators did all the rest. Not exactly similar working conditions here. But still, there is something to be said for consistency and Hera's character, in my opinion, is just missing it. Not irrevocably, mind you, and I will say that the series is still better with her in it. I'm a little flabbergasted with the fact that her son Jason goes on campaign with her wherever she goes, which could be the cause here. She does seem to act more out of emotion and sentimentality when he's around, and maybe this was deliberate, but what is this, Star Trek The Next Generation? Keep your kids at home, girl. Don't take your kids to war. Rosario Dawson, on the other hand, um... I'm not quite sure what's going on with her. All of my comments about makeup and discomfort and all that applies just as much here, if not more so, with someone playing a Tigruda. But Dawson's already delivered solid and consistent performances as Ahsoka in recent Star Wars series, so she's already given us a bar by which to measure her. But Ahsoka seems really out of step with the one that we saw her pull off in The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba. In those series, she was kind. Her experiences through the years had given her wisdom and patience, and she was always looking at long-term consequences. A reflection of this is her refusal to train Grogu, an incident which I will be bringing up later. In one scene here, she's practicing lightsaber forms she's known her whole life while grimacing and hissing like she's struggling or maybe on a mission to kill someone and filled with hate. 
contrasts this with pretty much any fight scene she's in, and she's calm, stoic, and every bit is in control of her actions as you would expect from a white or gray Jedi. There are several instances where she loses patience with others, which is very unlike the Ahsoka we had seen up to this point. It's like her temperament changes depending on what the plot demands. Also, there's this weird fighting style where she's shifted to full-on Kendo-style samurai. They've even started referring to her as a Ronin, which is also weird. But hey, I like a good anime as much as the next guy, and while this overt homage to Japanese culture is severely out of place in Star Wars, they've always taken some inspiration and design elements, so I guess it's not completely without precedence. It just doesn't seem to especially fit her character stylization. I think a lot of this comes from poor direction, but I could be wrong. In any case, it seems like we're exposed to two very different Ahsokas throughout the series, the one she needs to be when the plot demands she be flawed and vulnerable, and the one that we see when she's free to act naturally. One final portrayal I have just a few notes on is Hayden Christensen's return as Anakin Skywalker. I've brought this up a few times on the channel in relation to various things, but expecting an actor in their 40s to play the same character they did in their 20s, especially when they're trying to play the same character of the same age, it just doesn't work. Hayden Christensen is literally more than twice the age he was when Attack of the Clones came out, and there's very little chance of being able to pass these two characters off as the same person. But with that said, probably 80% of Ahsoka's portrayal of Anakin Skywalker is far better executed than when Deborah Chow attempted the same thing in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Using darker lighting tends to hide much of the age lines that Christensen has earned through an honest life of ranching after he retired from acting following the Revenge of the Sith. Also, the appearance of Anakin as a Force apparition is actually a very smart use of Christensen's age. Essentially, it could be interpreted as this being the true reflection of Anakin at the age of his death, without all the burns and dismemberment that came to define Darth Vader. As irritated as I was when they remastered the original trilogy and superimposed Christensen into the final scene of Return of the Jedi, his reappearance as a Force ghost today actually serves to vindicate that decision. With that said, there is one scene where Ahsoka is training while playing a hollow recording Anakin made for her while she was still his apprentice, and it's still the aged Christensen. If they would have paid just a tiny smidge more on the special effects budget, they could have de-aged Anakin to look the same age he was in Revenge of the Sith and had a perfect utilization of the character and actor. It was a small swing and a miss that otherwise could have made me eat my words from earlier videos complaining about Christensen's return to Star Wars. I'll give it a B plus, room for improvement, but far removed from failing. So I'm probably at the very bottom of the list of people considered to be the world's leading authorities on the lore of Star Wars, but there were a lot of things that I was under the impression were canon that are directly contradicted by Ahsoka's storyline. Any of you diehard fans out there, feel free to correct me on this, but as I understand things, the Dathomiri Zabrak are actually a hybrid race between the very similar looking Iridorians and humans that developed in isolation on the dark world-oriented planet of Dathomir. This hybridization leads female Zabrak to rarely have horns to have paler complexions, but at the same time leading male Zabrak to having brighter skin tones and leading to a higher tendency toward force sensitivity in all individuals. But now that origin story is pretty much gone. Now they're a race from another galaxy, or at the very least used to possess an intergalactic empire including temples on multiple worlds and distant populations that survived Dooku's purge of Dathomir. There's also a little point in the story, I think possibly too, where characters who should definitely know better refer to Ahsoka as being a Jedi Knight before Order 66. It's nuanced, but technically Ahsoka never accepted her knighthood and walked away from the Order as an apprentice. As such, you would think that no records from the Jedi Temple would have referred to her as a knight, but rather as an apprentice who deserted. I understand that to include this would have required a tiny bit more exposition, but the fact that they kept calling her an ex-Jedi knight rubbed me the wrong way for some reason. These are pretty much it for direct lore contradictions, which I know is precious few and a testament to Filoni trying to get things right. But the complete rewrite of Dathomir's history was a shame, and while Night Sister Magic definitely improved the story overall, I feel like there might have been better ways to accomplish this task that didn't involve undermining the established lore for one of the most established races in all of Star Wars. Okay, this part will inevitably result in spoilers, so if you're the type to whine about it, here's a timestamp you can jump to in order to avoid them. Are the blue milk drinkers gone yet? 
Okay, good. So this series, I'm sorry to say, is jam-packed with plot holes. Do you remember Hu Yang, the millennia-old droid that teaches younglings to construct their first lightsaber? He's here, traveling with Ahsoka, and nobody for one second seems to question why or how they came to be traveling in each other's company. Maybe there's a long-lost episode of Rebels that isn't expanded on by Wikipedia that explains it, but I for one as a filthy casual have questions about how the Chuba this droid survived Order 66 and the Purge and has now joined forces with Ahsoka. My personal pet peeve in the plot hole department comes from Ahsoka's decision to continue training Sabine Wren as her apprentice. Did you know she was being trained as a Jedi? Me neither. But the story very clearly states that Ahsoka stopped training Sabine after the Purge of Mandalore because the negative emotions Sabine was now feeling as a result of her homeworld and people being decimated meant that Force Adeptness would make her dangerous. This is the same reason that in The Mandalorian Season 2, Ahsoka refused to train Grogu, sensing that his deep attachment for Din Djarin would make him susceptible to the dark side. But then, after talking to Sabine and rifling through her things and seeing that she still has strong feelings for Ezra and hasn't moved on after all these years, decides that yep, Sabine should continue her training as a Jedi. What the dank, Beric? This is a direct conflict in Ahsoka's character, not just between her cartoon self and now, but between Rosario Dawson's own take on the character from series to series. This next one gets on my nerves quite a bit. There's a point in the story where Ahsoka and Hera head to Corellia to investigate the supposed dismantling of Morgan Elsbeth Industrial Complex after the fall of the Empire. After speaking to Dr. Taub, they insist on inspecting the facility, and as they tour the factory floor, they have this little exchange. This was one of Morgan's facilities. She supplied raw materials used in the construction of hyperdrive generators for Imperial-class Star Destroyers. Now, we're taking them apart and using the cores to power the new ships in the defense fleet. Do the facilities still employ any of her former staff? Of course, there's no other way to remain operational. An empire doesn't just become a republic overnight. You will still find ex-imperials at every level of the new republic government. Don't you worry about their loyalty? Not at all. The average worker doesn't care about the nuances of galactic politics. They have loyalty so long as they're paid. And you? I'm a businessman, General. My loyalty is to my investors. I'll leave the politics up to you. While Taub is certainly correct in that the average blue-collar worker rarely has the luxury of turning down paying work and will produce products regardless of who the intended consumer is, the insinuation that a business runner or owner doesn't care about politics is completely stupid and shows basically no understanding of entrepreneurship and economics. This statement very closely mirrors one that we got in Mandalorian Season 3. How are you finding the city? Comfortable, I hope. Yes though anything would be comfortable compared to the Outer Rim. <laughs> the Outer Rim, I can't imagine. You know, I was almost drafted. Imagine me serving. Oh, darling, that was the Empire. Oh, my apologies. Empire, Rebels, New Republic, I can't keep track. Again, this shows little understanding or intentional ignorance of the actual machinations of the upper classes. The insinuation that upper echelons of society are so insulated in their ivory towers that political upheaval, civil strife, war, change in government structure all go unnoticed is actually pretty insulting to pretty much everyone, regardless of class or social standing. Wealthy people usually become and stay wealthy through investment. Things like governments making changes to corporate taxation wage legislature, that's a hard thing to say, union legislature, legal bans on certain products or services, shifting between peacetime economies and wartime economies, industrial nationalization, all disproportionately affect those that have their wealth invested versus those of us at the bottom that are simply working paycheck to paycheck and have little to lose if the government increases taxes on long-term capital gains. While a lot of fans found that the insertion of politics and economics into the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones to be boring, it actually makes perfect sense if you're trying to explain explain why the Clone Wars happened in the first place and how the Emperor was able to take control. These assertions that the wealthy simply sit around all day counting their credits is pandering at best and as I said is insulting to pretty much everyone and really should stop showing up in Star Wars. The final plot hole I want to bring attention to other than many that I'm sure were left as teasers for next season, at least I hope that's the case otherwise I might have to make a video that's nothing but the plot holes of Ahsoka. But the final one for this video has to do with the origins of Marek. Marek is the ex-inquisitor who bears a striking resemblance to the Eighth Brother. After the Ahsoka trailer came out, there was much speculation on whether this was actually the Eighth Brother, but I think the general consensus is that they aren't the same character, but rather two individuals with similar uniforms. Then again, there was a lot of disagreement on whether these two Grand Inquisitors were the same person, and at the end of Obi-Wan Kenobi, it was revealed that in fact, yes, these are supposed to be the same individual. Swing and a miss for the fanbase, and Deborah Chow.
I really should have a chow bash meter in my Star Wars videos. Anyway, we know Merrick works very closely with the ex-Jedi Balin Skull and his something more apprentice Shin Hadi. You, I trained to be something more. Which opens up so many questions. How did an ex-Inquisitor, one, survive what was surely a second purge when the Emperor deemed them obsolete, and two, how was he ever convinced to join forces with a Jedi survivor like Balin? It would have to be a pretty good story in order to make any sense. We did see something similar with the joining forces and eventual romance between Asajj Ventress and Quinlan Vos, a story arc that is considered by many to be one of the best in the entire Star Wars universe, but these two also existed in a very different galaxy from that of the post-Purge Empire. Sadly, we got no answers and even more questions when Ahsoka kills the 8th Brut, I mean, Merrick, who disintegrates into a cloud of black dust, which actually sort of stinks of Night Sister magic, so considering we got zombie stormtroopers later, it's not a huge stretch to assume that Merrick might be a Night Sister zombie of the 8th Brother. But still, we don't know his race, his history, his motivations, only that he was part of a pack of rogue force users and is now dead, pretty much a pointless waste of our time all around. Another thing that was just a little bothersome for me was the structure. While writing the script, I did go back and look at the runtimes of other Fantastic Star Wars series. Okay, it's the only Fantastic Star Wars series at this point. But as I was getting ready to watch Ahsoka, I couldn't help but notice that the runtimes for each episode vary widely, from 57 minutes all the way down to a mere 37 minutes. Which I know they're writing this for a streaming service, but I was expecting more uniformity in runtime. You know, for if it was ever screened on TV, which I guess that's probably not gonna happen here in the 2020s. Anyway, just to make sure I wasn't making mountains out of pork nests, I did check the run times on Andor, and they're all over the place as well, with the longest episode being 57 minutes and the shortest being 38 minutes. But overall, it was slightly more uniform, with most episodes being averaged between 45 and 50 minutes in length. But fair is fair, I guess this is just normal now. The other thing that bugged me a bit was the sharp tonal shifts in the first episode. We start with an arrogant turd of a captain commanding a ship who lets two people People claiming to be Jedi on board, who then massacre most if not all of his crew, which, dang, I was actually pretty happy with. The use of orange lightsabers instead of red was a nice touch. We often forget that not all Dark Force users bleed their kyber crystals red. But then we jump directly to Lothal, where there's the cliche, here's a monument that needs a speech, and the person giving the speech is nowhere to be found. Then we cut to Sabine Wren racing down an empty roadway while fast-paced music plays in the background and running from the cops, who aren't there to arrest her, but she's being a rebel because... I've got nothing. Then we get tonal whiplash again and again. Thankfully, this is only a problem in the first episode, but it was hard to get a read on what this series was supposed to be. Sabine's antics also left me worried that this was going to devolve into the typical Disney gender politics taking center stage, but thank the force, that is nowhere to be seen. Now, arguments could be made that Ahsoka's predominantly female cast opposing predominantly male antagonists makes this yet another in a long line of recent Disney films that pushes neo-feminist propaganda, while others could point to Thrawn's condescension as mansplaining. But to both of those groups of people, I say, shut up, you're idiots, go play outside. Sabine struggles to wield the force. She isn't an instant natural who becomes a master of the force with barely any effort or often without training. Every victory she enjoys was earned through hard work and dedication. Ahsoka is supposed to be the one with all the answers or at least the most insight, but she still suffers defeat, still has some growing up to do, and is still learning from her old master. Hera butts heads with an insufferable male senator multiple times, but at the end of the day it's clear that he's actually the one operating within the bounds of the law, even if he may or may not be an imperial loyalist. Okay, let's face it, he obviously is. Thrawn is the evil mastermind, but doesn't really possess a lot of the traits of toxic masculinity. As for his constant justification for his actions, it's difficult for a man not to explain his actions to a woman when literally everyone he converses with in the series are women. Thrawn is propped up by virtually every piece of Star Wars media that references him as a genius of military strategy and is primarily conversing with religious zealots and an industrialist. So yeah, there's plenty of reason for his actions to make perfect sense to himself, but not to those around him. Enough said on that topic, let's start wrapping things up. So Pazak cards on the table. Is Ahsoka actually any good? Despite rambling for the past, oh, this many minutes about all the things that Ahsoka gets wrong, I actually found it pretty darn engaging. The fight sequences are pretty well choreographed. The performances, for the most part, seem true to the source material. The threat of lasting consequence is there, and every victory and defeat feels earned. No deus ex machina. Okay, a little deus ex machina, but that's the force, baby. Plot armor at its most formidable. Each of the villains were veiled in mystery and didn't exposition 
transition us to death on their goals, intentions, and histories. They say just enough to remind us that they are rooted in this universe without giving away the ending too early. The show doesn't waste time on misdirection, plot twists, or over-the-top fight scenes. It's a return to the Star Wars films of old, where skill with a lightsaber and a couple force pushes are all that you need to win the day. I definitely recommend you check this out if you haven't already. I still don't think it's on the same level as Andor or anything, and the second season has so many structure problems to overcome that it's probably going to suck. Especially since I just learned that Ray Stevenson, the actor who portrayed Balin Skull, passed away in May of 2023. And as someone who is also 6 foot 3 with graying hair and weighs more than 250 pounds, okay a lot more but that's not the point, I'm just saying it's hard to find someone else that can literally fill Balin Skull's shoes. But for now, with season 1 of Ahsoka in the books, I would place it light years ahead of the book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi and probably about on par with season 1 of The Mandalorian. If you're still watching, thank you, it means a lot. If you've enjoyed, a like on the video would be appreciated as viewer engagement is the primary metric I use to determine the sort of content you find folks are interested in. Please, thank you, and may the force be with you always.